a master of noir crime fiction. Novelist, screenwriter, essayist, and memoirist James Elroy is more closely identified with Los Angeles than any writer since Raymond Chandler. Nearly all of his writing is set in Los Angeles in the rough, racist, pre-Miranda Los Angeles of the decade following the Second World War. Four of his novels, The Black Dahlia, The Big Nowhere, L.A. Confidential, and White Jazz, are collectively known as the L.A. Quartet. His novels, American Tabloid, The Cold 6000, and Bloods of Rover, form the Underworld USA trilogy. American Tabloid and his memoir, My Dark Places, were both named as Time Magazine's best book of the year, respectively. In 1997, LA Confidential was adapted to the screen in an Academy Award winning film directed by Curtis Hansen, and in 2007, Brian De Palma directed the film adaptation of The Black Dahlia. Elroy himself has been the subject of seven documentary films, including Feast of Death by Academy Award winning filmmaker Vikram Jayanti. His newest novel, Perfidia, published by Knopf and was just released three days ago. With that, please join me in welcoming James Elroy. Good evening, audience. Good evening, Joan. I've been thinking of you. Thank you for coming out tonight. I realize you had options. You could have stayed home and attended to your sex lives, your <laughs> drug habits, and your neurotic and ungrateful children, but you didn't. <laughs> you came here to see me, and I am nothing but grateful. T.S. Eliot wrote, in my beginning is my end, and in my end is my beginning. I'm going back now to the ultimate creative genesis and chronological beginning of my life's work as a historical novelist. Perfidia is the first novel in the second L.A. Quartet. The original L.A. Quartet, which was published between 1985 and 1992, covered the years 1946 to 1958 in Los Angeles. Those four novels are The Black Dahlia, The Big Nowhere, L.A. Confidential, and White Jazz. Those four novels were followed by the Underworld USA trilogy. American Tabloid, The Cold 6000, A Bloods a Rover. Those three novels published between 97 and 2009, covered 1958 to 1972 in America at large. The design of the second LA Quartet is unprecedented. I am taking real life and fictional characters from the first two bodies of work and placing them in Los Angeles during World War II as significantly younger people. Ross MacDonald wrote, in the end I possess my birthplace and am possessed by its language. Geography is destiny. I got lucky. I was hatched in LA, the film noir epicenter, at the height of the film noir era. And the language of the time owns me. I love its vile vibrato. I love its vindaloo-like heat and ability to vilify. I love all forms of racist invective. I love black hepcat jive jazz talk. I love Yiddish. I love alliteration. In my world, all hard C words should be spelled with a KKK. -K -K. <laughs> Frank O'Connor wrote, a literature that cannot be vulgarized is no literature at all and will not last. We are going into the deep, dark, vile, throbbing, hilarious heart of the American idiom in Perfidia, which is a 700 page novel told between the days December 6th, 1941 up through 
December 29th. Yes, it's the day before the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. It is the beginning of that grave injustice that came to be known as the Japanese internment. It's volume one of the second LA Quartet. The four viewpoints are people you may recall as buried names in earlier books of mine or as major characters. There is Dudley Smith, the demonic, demonic, dynamic, corrupt Irish cop from the Big Nowhere, LA Confidential, and White Jazz. There is William H. Parker, the greatest American policeman of the 20th century, who we know from LA Confidential. There is Kay Lake, the female lead of the Black Dahlia. And there is a young Japanese American forensic chemist who is only vaguely referenced in the Black Dahlia, a youth named Hideo Ishida. Tonight I'll read a brief excerpt from Perfidia. Then I would honor the most invasively over personal questions <laughs> that each and every one of you peepers, prowlers, petter ass, pence, panty sniffers, punks, and pimps has for me. I'll start with the prologue and go to a little bit of chapter two. Reminiscenza. I wandered off in a prairie blizzard 85 years ago. The cold rendered me spellbound then to now. I have outlived the decree and find myself afraid to die. I cannot will cloudbursts the way I once did. I must recollect with yet greater fury. It was a fever then. It remains a fever now. I will not die as long as I live this story. I run to then to buy myself moments now. 23 days, blood libel. A policeman knocks on a young woman's door. Murderer's flags a swirl. 23 days. The Storm, Reminiscenza. Chapter 2, K. Lake's Diary, compiled and chronologically inserted by the Los Angeles Police Museum. Los Angeles, Saturday, December 6th, 1941, 11.23 a.m. I've begun this diary on impulse. An extraordinary scene unfolded as I sat on my separate bedroom terrace. I was sketching the southern view and heard the rumble of engines below me on the strip. I immediately got up and wrote down this precise time and date. I sensed what the rumble portended and I was right. A line of armored vehicles chugged west on sunset to fevered scrutiny and applause. It took a full 10 minutes for the armada to pass. The noise was loud, the cheers louder. People stopped their cars to get out and salute the young soldiers. It played hell with the flow of traffic but no one seemed to care. The soldiers were delighted by this display of affection. They waved and blew kisses. A half dozen waitresses from Dave's Blue Room ran out and passed them cases of liquor. Somebody shouted, America. And that's when I knew the war is coming. I'm going to enlist. I always do what I say I'm going to do. I formally state my intent 
and proceed from that point. I am going to write a diary entry every day until the present world conflict concludes or the world blows up. I will walk away from my easy existence and seek official postings near the front lines. I live a dilettante's life now. My compulsive sketch artistry is a schoolgirl's attempt to capture confounding realities. My piano studies and emerging proficiency with the easier Chopin nocturnes stall my pursuit of a true cause. This lovely home in no way allays my psychic discomfort. Lee Blanchard's indulgence is disconcerting more than anything else. This diary is a broadside against stasis and unrest. I have always felt superior to my surroundings. This house states that case most tellingly. I picked out every German expressionist print and every stick of blonde wood furniture. I'm a prairie girl from Sioux Falls, South Dakota and a gifted Aravist. I'm moving into my separate bedroom now. My own work is arrogantly displayed on the walls, interspersed with clay and Kandinsky. There are a dozen drawings of a light heavyweight named Bucky Bleichert. He has a hungry young man's body and large buck teeth. I have sketched him many times from ringside seats at the Olympic. Bucky Bleichert is a local celebrity who understands the ephemeral quality of celebrity and does not view boxing as his true cause. His circumspection in the ring delights me. I have never spoken to Bucky Bleichert, but I am certain that I understand him. Because I was a local celebrity once, it was February of 39. I was 19. It all pertained to a bank robbery and its alleged solution. This house, a refuge a few years ago, a trap now. The robbery got me this house, not Lee's prudently invested fight winnings. Lee Blanchard is not a savvy investor, as is commonly held nor is he my lover in the common sense. He entered my life to facilitate my destiny, whatever that is. I know it now. Sioux Falls was an insufficient destiny. The winter cold spells and summer heat waves left people dead. Indians strayed from nearby reservations and stabbed one another in speakeasies. Klansmen broke a Negro man out of the county jail. He was accused of raping a dim-witted white girl. The girl was slow to condemn or exonerate the man accused. The Klansmen convened a kangaroo court. The Klansmen staked him over a red ant hill in mid-August. The summer sun, or the ants, killed him. Local lore was divided on this. Protestants despised the few local Catholics. Nativist groups flourished throughout the Depression. Methodists were at odds with Lutherans and Baptists and vice versa. A range war over prized cattle broke out in 34. 14 men were killed near the Iowa state line. My parents and older brother were sweet natured and content. Their only sin was lack of imagination. I pretended to be one of them in order to live within myself unobstructed. I lived to read, draw, and roam. People talked about me. 
I dropped Racy Bon Mott's in church. I did not care about my family. That fact mildly horrified me. I wanted to run away to Los Angeles and become someone else there. I got a job at a bookstore and stole a month's worth of cash receipts. I left my parents a perfunctory note of farewell. It was November 36. I was 16. The bus ride west featured dust storms and a flash flood near Albuquerque. Armed goons were stationed at the California border. They were charged to keep indigent Okies out. They were moonlighting LA policemen. They were a potent view of my destiny. That armored convoy has now passed out of range. That motorized rumble has now left my body. Nothing before this moment exists. The war is coming. I'm going to enlist. All right, cats, you have the floor. Yes, this man here. This will be rather pedestrian, uh, considering what you asked for. But how long does it take you to write a book of 700 pages, and what time of the day or night do you write? Daddy O, it took me two and a half years. The outline for this book is 700 pages long. I write by hand, yes. I have never used a computer. I'm computer illiterate. I don't have a cell phone. I have ignored the digital age. I have never logged onto a computer. I've written all 19 of my books and all my film work by hand. I have a full-time assistant and a woman who types for me and who can read my laboriously scrawled block printing. I began Perfidia with a set of ideas. It unfurled in my mind in some detail. I supplanted it with paid for research. A researcher compiled fact sheets and chronologies. The book is written in real time. It covers the bulk of December 1941. I never look research wise for secret information. Ooh, what's the secret dirt from the CIA archives? No, plain old newspaper shit is good enough for me. What I look for is history and the latitude to extrapolate fictionally. When I saw that the first month of the roundups of allegedly subversive Japanese were chaotic in nature, I rejoiced because I had that much more room to maneuver fictionally. Fact sheets, chronologies, notes on character, historical notes, notes on Japanese culture, plot notes. From there, I wrote the outline. From there, I wrote the book. Two and a half years. Reminiscenza. That means reminiscence in Italian. It's one of those words that you'll love, and you read it in a foreign language, you know what it means. Next question. I'm listening. Yes, man in the back. Um, I'm trying to tell if it was just hearing you read it that made it sound this way, or if your style has become a little different from your previous books. This, you're right in both, on both accounts. For one thing, this is a diary entry written in the first person by a 21-year-old woman. I have never written from a woman's viewpoint in the first person through an entire book. The entire novel three third-person subjective viewpoints, Hideo Ishida, William H. Parker, Dudley Smith, and Kay Lake in diary format there, everything is a more explicated style. It's more consistent with America and Los Angeles in 1941. And this book is, at its core, a primer on belief. This was a time of deep, often wrong-headed, 
frequently outlandish belief in America and the world. My characters spent a great deal of time in ponder. Hence, the book has a more explicated style. Thank you. You're welcome. Yes. Uh, I'm Japanese American, uh, and follow, my followers in camp. Thank you for recognizing that it was a grave injustice, the incarceration. Mm -hmm. I mean, in, in, as I read the book, am I going to find that you, you view the whole incarceration experience as a noir event, the, the, the economic greed, the race hatred, the, uh, I would say the confusion of the, of the roundup? Is that kind of, does it kind of fit into your, I'm a fan of your work too, so does it kind of yeah. fit into your, your thing? It's all there, and I view it as the injustice at the heart of my work. And it's taken me a long time to get around to it. And it took me a long time to get around to World War II in general. Here's the genesis of it. It was the winter, cold winter night in Los Angeles. February of 08, it was a Saturday night. I was living in an apartment on Rossmore. It was a noisy apartment, it was in Hollywood looking southbound, wondering why I didn't have a girlfriend, when a flash came over me. Bam, just like that. It was a complete non sequitur. I saw handcuffed Japanese Americans in the back of an army truck. Men up front, soldiers with submachine guns. The truck was covered. They were being led up a snow-capped hillside to the Manzanar internment camp in the Owens Valley, February 1942. The initial internment order was implemented that month. It came to me in a flash, the second LA Quartet. Characters from the LA Quartet, the Underworld USA trilogy, in LA as much younger people. Volume one, Perfidia, the murder of a Japanese American family in the hours preceding the Pearl Harbor attack. I recalled a throwaway paragraph from the Black Dahlia. Bucky Bleichert, who's referenced here in Kay Lake's reading, narrates the entire novel. He ruminates that he had to rat out his boyhood friend Hideo Ishida to the LAPD alien squad to get on LAPD circa 42. Hence, Hideo Ishida, in the course of a 40-second brain flash, became the hero of this book. And that's the genesis right there. That's how it all came to me. And yes, you're right, the Japanese internment, the, the inequitous seizure of assets, monies, land properties, some draconian plans that never came to fruition are at the heart of my noir configuration. Although I have never viewed my books as noir, I viewed them as historical romances set in Los Angeles, the film noir epicenter, during the film noir era. Thank you. You're welcome. Yes, man in the back. I've only got through about the first third of the new book. You're digging it, boss? I do. <laughs> All right, good. God bless you. I was wondering if uh, the Jack Webb kind of being like the fly on the wall for Dudley mm -hmm. Smith's Goon Spot, is that inspired by your actual interactions with police detectives? I know I've seen a lot of documentaries and reality shows where you're kind of like the fly on the wall for homicide detectives. Is I've never been, been a cop buff. I have a great many policemen friends. I'm a spokesman for the Los Angeles Police Department, and I am the MC every year for their Jack Webb Awards. The one question you can't answer as pertains to a book like this is what's real and what's not. What I can tell you about Jack Webb is that Jack Webb went to Belmont High School in Los Angeles, was in fact class president, at the same time that the presumably fictional Hideo Ishida and Bucky Bleichert went there and that Jack Webb was sure as shit 21 years old at the time of the Pearl Harbor attack. 
and he sure as hell had the big bone for a policeman, as we know from Dragna. Yes? Hey, hey, I want to, what do you read right now? I don't read anything. No. I've, the last splendid novel I read was my friend Thomas Mallon's book, Watergate. And I would urge all of you to read Watergate. The title says it all. The book was published two and a half years ago. It is a stunning, beautiful, heartbreaking book. And Tom and I share a great theme, and it's this, and a great device, and it's this. We exposit the secret human infrastructure of large public events. And Watergate does that brilliantly. Also, if you've ever wondered what really happened during that scandal, Tom's book will tell you. He has a book coming out next year called Finale, and it's about Reagan and Gorbachev at Reykjavik. And I think it'll be great. I just read a few of the introductory pages and one thing about the radio transcript from mm -hmm. Plan Radio. Uh, has me thinking, is there a particular source you have for Argo and the racist language and the slang? Is there a historical basis for that? It's largely invented. <laughs> it's 20% of the time it's 30% in my blood. I love the American idiom in all its forms. Those that are censored now, those that are censured now, and those that have been in the parlance for decades. And I have a killer instinct for it. I was on Market Street in San Francisco two nights ago. I saw an extremely good looking gunmetal gray and white pit bull eyeballing a cat. <laughs> the pit bull was on a leash, which was lucky for the cat. I have that kind of focus when it comes to the American idiom. I am the pit bull and it is the cat. And cat, by the way, you have to spell correctly, is spelled K-K-K-A-T. Yeah. Yes? Second question. Do you, do you have other writer friends that you associate with other writers? Thomas Mallon, my good friend. Walter Kern, the estimable Walter Kern, author of the recent bestseller, Blood Will Out, also My Heart Bargain, Up in the Air, and Thumbsucker is a good friend of mine. My beloved second ex-wife, who's my best friend, Helen Canode, author of one of the great Hollywood novels, The Ticket Out, also Wildcat play. I'm not just saying that because she's my ex-wife. <laughs> They're the big three, Canode, Kern, and Mallon. Yes, woman over here. Yeah. And writing books. Do you do it in the here and now or do you do it in the war? How do you mean? I mean, is it kind of colored in your head? Do you like view things war? Or or do your characters exist here and now with you? Noir you said. Yeah, well, Keep in mind. No. Yeah, I like film noir, most of it is shit, frankly. <laughs> we we have a disingenuous desire to go back to that time when, frankly, doom was fun, when cigarettes were safe to smoke, when everybody was hopped up on, on dope and a great deal of booze and the clothes were tremendous and the air was clean and the cars were good and America was flying high because of its World War II victory. But you might not have wanted to live there if you could go back there today and look around. Film is an artifact of that time and it's largely style. Most of the movies bite the big one when viewed from the standpoint of 2014. I write historical romances set during the film noir era. Film noir era is really 1945 to 1960. This book precedes that. 
I have ignored the digital age. I have also ignored the current cultural age. I have no interest in the world the way it is now. I don't go to movies. I don't watch television. I don't read newspapers. I think 1941, for all intents and purposes, the last two and a half years of my life have been 1941. Don't get me wrong, I'm happy to be here with you in 2014, <laughs> but I'll go back to the hotel at the end of the evening and I'll have moved on to the time frame of the new book, which is January of 1942 through to the end of the summer. Do you watch TV? No. No, I don't. I brood. I brood. I listen to classical music. The soundtrack, other than the great Glenn Miller version of Perfidia for this book, the soundtrack was Shostakovich's thunderous Tenth Symphony. Herbert von Karajan conducts the Berlin Philharmonic Orchestra and Samuel Barber's plaintive violin concerto, which was first performed in 1939, so it's synchronous with the book. Yes, woman over here. Your outlines sound almost as long as your novels. And I was wondering, how did you arrive at that technique for yourself? I'm extremely diligent, methodical, and painstaking. I want a large book that is fully explicated in scope that is inextricably wound together in strands of milieu, character development, backstory, and plot. The only way you can do something like that is to greatly diagram in advance. It's a process that takes me, after the initial planning and research, a full nine months. And thank God that I do it. You can't get a book this plotted, this densely structured. Whatever you think of this book, it may not be for you in some ways, but it is an entirely coherent work of art, if I do say so myself, and I do. <laughs> Yes. Yeah, so can you outline the, the rest of the court set? I mean, they go through the uh, evacuation, the, the, the camps, and the close of the camps? Yes, yeah. It's all set in Los Angeles. It's the key Los Angeles event of World War II. So we'll see the entire thing. We'll play out over the next three novels. It'll occur in the distance, though. I, th I think we're going to take. I think we're going to take some excursions to Mansfield. Yeah. yeah, yeah, you'll see. You'll see. Yes. I know in the late '90s you were talking about doing a historical novel about like the Warren G. Harding administration. Yeah, that was then. This is now. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Ohio in the '20s, nah, brother. Yeah. L.A., come on vacation, go home on probation. <laughs> Yes. Is the young Spade Cooley going to turn up anywhere in this quartet? Is pardon me? A young Spade Cooley going to show up anywhere in this quartet? You know, let's see. Spade Cooley was born in what, 1910. He'd be 31 years old. It's not a bad idea. Huh. Spade Cooley whacked his wife in 1961. He occurs in what? My novella, Dickentino's Blues, the Spadester. Huh. Bad guy. His wife wanted to join a free love cult. He took issue. <laughs> Who could blame him? He died at the concert for the LA County Sheriff's. He, he, sure, he sure did, yeah. yeah. It's a great line from John McCarthy's novel. Spike came in from the cold where Alec Lemus ruminates to one of his communist captors. Yeah, I had a communist girlfriend. She believed in free love. It was all I could afford. <laughs> yes, man over here. I was wondering how much overlap um, with the uh, USA Underworld trilogy you'll have with these um, second LA quartet books. You see at the back of Perfidia, I would urge everyone who hasn't read me before to buy Perfidia and start at the chronological beginning 
of my life's work. There is a Dramatis Personae list at the back of the book. There are 42 characters from the L.A. Quartet and the Underworld USA trilogy who appear in Perfidia as younger people. All the previous appearances of my work have been noted, as well as the new characters in this book. So you'll see after you finish the book. Don't go to the list first. <laughs> It'll mess you up. Yes? Yeah, you say you don't follow up modern day TV, film, mm -hmm. journalism, but uh, you must be curious about the Hollywood interpretations of uh, LA Confidential and Black Dahlia. Well, I've you've seen, seen them. You've seen yeah. them. Oh, yeah. So uh, what's, what's, your, uh, what's your take on it? There's movies you want to see, like LA Confidential, and there's movies you want to flee like the Black Dahlia. <laughs> Now that stated, I should add that money is the gift that no one ever returns. The color green is always flattering and the size large always fits. And since I take the money, I have no moral right to criticize any turkey movie made from one of my books for attribution. Sometimes you get lucky More often than not, you just get the money from nothing and they don't even make the movie. That's How would you compare the movie LA Competition to the book? It's 15% of the overall story. <laughs> as good a movie as it is. I thought it was a fabulous movie. It's a very light version of a book that I thought was irreducible. That, and I don't like several of the key performances. That stated, it's also a fine cinematic work of art, and it's a work of art that had its genesis in me and could not have had its genesis anywhere else, but it is also something that even I couldn't have imagined because I'm not a film director, a cinematographer, or an actor. So 15% of, of your work of the book is actually in there and what there is in there has been softened, reinterpreted, chronologically compressed and thematically reworked. And it's still quite a fine movie. And I thought the movie itself was fairly complex. There are plot holes, brother, and trust me, <laughs> I know I wrote the book. Yeah. 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 Yes, man in the back. Uh, so in 2000, when I was writing a history book about L.A., and I was mm -hmm. going to skip over World War II because I've got so many people that had already done World War II. Um, and then the attacks of September 11 sort of made me live mm -hmm. through this sort of wartime moment that made me realize I wanted to say a lot more and there was a lot more to mm -hmm. be said about it. I'm just wondering where your sense of having lived through the war is, how that shapes your thinking about the wartime moment and you know, how you're recreating it. Here's a story that's true. As a boy, young boy, six, seven, eight years old, I thought World War II was still going on. It was that pervasive in the American memory. Now, I was born in 1948, three years after the war ended. I lived through the Korean War, which ran from 1950 to 1953. I don't recall it. People never talked about it. The war was World War II. I thought it was still going on. One day in 1956, when I was eight years old, I said something that alerted my mother to the mis this misconception. And she said, no, Sonny, the war ended in 45, three years before you were born. And I couldn't believe it. I'm not quite sure it isn't still going on. It still is with me. I live to an uncommon degree in my imagination. I assure you I'm not delusional. I know it's 2014. It's specifically September 12th, 2014. I know that Franklin D. Roosevelt is not the president of the United States. I know the digital world exists. But I spend a lot of time sitting in the dark. 
A, talking to women who aren't in the room with me, and B, rethinking, reliving, and rewriting history to my own specifications. It's immersion, and that's where these books originate. Yes, Kelly. Could you speak a little bit about what drew you to William H. Parker as one of the main protagonists in your book? William H. Parker was born in 1902 and died in 1966. He's the greatest American policeman of the 20th century. He is the cop that J. Edgar Hoover wished that he was. The greatest crime fighter of the American 20th century was Robert F. Kennedy. He went after the mob, hammer and tong. Robert F. Kennedy very much wanted to replace J. Edgar Hoover with William H. Parker, but Jack Kennedy was assassinated, as we all know, in November of 1963. And Lyndon Johnson took over and decided to retain Hoover. Whiskey Bill Parker was a man consumed with guilt because he was the aide-de-camp to the corrupt police chief James Edgar Two-Gun Davis, who's also a character in Perfidia. William H. Parker was a Roman Catholic and a devout one in a very Protestant police department. He hailed piously and alcoholically from Deadwood, South Dakota. He was the grandson of a Civil War Union Army Colonel, U.S. Attorney for the Colorado Territory, and later in his life a United <coughs> States Congressman, a man who drank himself to death, cirrhosis of the liver, in 1960, excuse me, uh, at the age of 61. Parker was on and off the sauce most of his life. He was, and I know this as a sober alcoholic, what we call self-will run riot. He was an astonishingly brilliant man, a very gifted attorney at law, a firm believer in the corruption-free military model of police work. He got in a great deal of trouble late in his life and besmirched his legacy with a few intemperate racist remarks that in no way did justice to his career as the greatest reforming police chief of the 20th century. I love William H. Parker and am determined to set the record straight about him. Thank you. You're welcome. A couple more questions. Yes? I hear you like uh, phone calls to wrong numbers, and I was wondering if you could tell us about one that you've gotten. <laughs> phone calls to wrong numbers. Uh, wow, is this, did you get this off the internet? Uh, you had an interview for a podcast that I heard. With, uh, I got a wrong number phone call when I was 21 years old from a woman, and we had a, a heart shaking conversation. Then she said she'd meet me for coffee and never showed up. It's, maybe that's one reason why I'm always checking to make sure that the receiver is on my landline <laughs> telephone since I don't have a cell phone. Hope Springs Infernal. <laughs> <laughs> yes, man here. Uh, I may have been uh, confused, but uh, I thought that the Calix first uh, entry in her diary was on December 6th. Uh huh, yeah. It sounded like, it sounded like the, the, uh, what was happening might be December 7th. No, no. The armored convoy, the war was imminent. Yeah. And we were fortifying coastal batteries in Southern California. So as it happened, army trucks were just pouring through Los Angeles in the two days preceding the attack. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yes. About your decision to do the K Lake chapters as a journal entry, whereas you seem to typically do your narrators as like from the perspective of the character. Does that make sense? K 
Kay Lake was always my favorite female character. I wanted a, f a heroine who embodied the feminine spirit of wartime America in all its contradiction, in all its madcap grit, and I realized Kay Lake was the voice. I knew her dialogue voice from her appearance as the female lead in The Black Dahlia. The way I get around this is thusly. We're never in Kay's viewpoint in The Black Dahlia. We're in Bucky Bleichert's first person viewpoint throughout the entire book. Thus, all of her diary entries, in fact, her entire swath through this big novel set six years before The Black Dahlia, what it does is circumscribe the story that she has withheld from her ultimate husband, Bucky Bleichert. Yes, woman over here. If you hadn't become a novelist, do you ever wonder what you would have become? I would have become a Lutheran pastor. <laughs> Undoubtedly, yes. Couple more questions. We're running. Let's say it's pushing. Yeah, it's pushing eight o'clock. Yes, man over here. Have you just been talking out your your outline, or is it really just you in a room with a pen and some paper? The outline begins with prologue. Kayla sets the time and the tonal chord in an elegiac five-paragraph spiel. Go to. Gerald L. K. Smith's vituperative KLAN radio broadcast that sets the stage of World War II about to pop. Chapter one, Hideo Ishida's viewpoint. Boom, 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 boom. Why did that woman walk out so close to the end, shaking her head? Did I say something wrong? <laughs> Pardon me? She left smiling. She left smiling? <laughs> Okay. If you get stuck, though, what do you do? I never get stuck, brother. I've got all the <laughs> notes there. I've got everything in front of me. I don't go on until I get unstuck. If I hit a logical jam, I sit there and figure it all out. Yes? How do you keep everything organized if you're writing 700 longhand pages? How do you keep it all organized and reference? <laughs> I have hundreds of pages of notes. I have research material. I do a shorthand run through with abbreviations and character names signified by initials. And that is the precursor to the actual formal outline. What I do very, very well, and arguably better than anyone, is plot, plan, think, and sustain concentration. I like to think, and it's a result of spending so, so very much time alone. And I'm solitary by nature, and I like to get down in the grip of my own thoughts. Yes? What does that, um, what does that uh, very fastidious planning process do to do for your editing process? What it allows me to do is write pithily to the point because I know the overall arc of the book is inviolate. All the strands are inextricably wound. Having a superstructure this deep, this dense, allows me to live improvisationally in the individual sense. So the scenes pop in the moment and they are inextricably tied together. Yes. Do you sleep at night or you just keep going? I sleep. Yeah. You get up in the morning first thing and go back at it? I quite often go to bed at 8 o'clock and get up at 2.30 in the morning. I like that sense of, it's like the pit bull back on Market Street with the cat. I like that, I want to get the drop on the world. 
Do you write when do you write when you get up or do you, you say that to later? No, I I write when I get up. Yeah. Do you get the trouble imagining uh, female characters? And you're speaking now in uh, first person through Kate's mm -hmm. uh, diary. Mm -hmm. uh, is that a big step for you? Or? Yeah. Yeah. I've written short diary excerpts from women's viewpoints before, but I've never attempted anything like this. So, uh, so how did you uh, do it? Was there a stretch for you? It was just the leap of imagination. The voice just came. I live in the idiom. I live in the language. Yes, Kelly. I've never read a character like Dudley Smith in any books I've read before, and I was curious where he came from. I made him up. He's in The Big Nowhere, L.A. Confidential, and White Jazz. He's just, he's a figment of my imagination. What influenced his character? Again, okay. since I live in times past, since I live in America in times past, since I live specifically in Los Angeles in times past, my imagination flourishes within this framework. Thus, a character like Dudley Smith is, is part and parcel of my life's immersion. I can't cite a specific moment that he occurred to me. But I brought him back from extinction from three novels as a younger man. And you've read the entire book, mm -hmm. so you know how it plays out. Yes. Thank you. You're welcome. Do you have a social life? <laughs> yeah, I have, a, I have a social life. It's not much of one. <laughs> I talk to my ex-wife on the telephone. I have some friends and colleagues. I talk to them, yes. Yeah. Does anyone want to ask me the profound question, why do you write? Why do you write? Anyone else? Uh, yeah, why do you write? Why do you write? Right. Why do you write? Yeah, all right, why do you write? Thank you, brother. In my craft or sullen art, exercised in the still night, when only the moon rages and the lovers lie abed with all their griefs in their arms, I labor by singing light, not for the strut and trade of charms, upon the ivory stages, but for the common wages of their most secret heart. Not for the proud man apart do I write on these spindrift pages, but for the lovers, their arms around the griefs of the ages, who pay no praise or wages, nor heed my art or craft. Dylan Thomas. Thanks for coming, folks.